What's the question you get asked most day in, day out? Is it inflation and central banks? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, look, we got asked in many questions. I would say probably the most frequent one are inflation and unemployment. I mean, what is, while I think inflation is, uh, is slowly coming down, and I think the numbers yesterday is clearly confirming the thesis that inflation is a bit more under control, uh, what is a bit uh, striking is the resilience and the strength of labor market on both sides of the ocean which is the other element that would give us comfort in believing that uh, as we go in 2024, uh, markets will buy more aggressively into a basically reversal of central banks uh, tightening. Uh, there's a number of uh, structural reasons probably for labor market. To us, probably the best explanation is that uh, given the shortage in uh, labor market that many firms have seen after pandemic, mm -hmm. They are very, very cautious in, uh, in, in taking more radical action because they know that it's going to be very tough to rehire when the economy will restart. So um, unemployment, inflation, uh, probably the most uh, tricky question at this stage. And I think uh, uh, the rally yesterday is, is quite meaningful because yeah. I think it signals that there's appetite for risky assets the moment that there's a clear outlook. Now, having said that, uh, I think is uh, definitely the numbers yesterday is, is, is a bit better. Uh, but our view is that central banks uh, will try to be, will err on the safe side, meaning that until they will have really significant confirmation that inflation is under control, they will not, uh, they will not start easing. So it might take a bit longer than market is discounting right now. Uh, I'm really happy you came in today because I feel like we have everything. So we have the U.S. inflation number in the U.S., the rally that you were talking about. We also have President Xi and Biden meeting. And it seems that markets have largely discounted or not really focused on geopolitics. Again, is there a worry that, you know, markets are looking at the wrong things and that actually they, they don't know, even know how to price stagflation, which is what you're, uh, you know, potentially hinting at if the labor market stays strong? Well, look, it's a, it's a very difficult market to navigate um, cyclically, but I would say even more structurally. Uh, you know, one of the theses we have been uh, putting in the world in the, with our clients is that we're living in a world of what we call um, four multiple transitions. So everyone has been focusing really on the uh, ecological transition and energy transition. But at the same time, we're seeing a technological transition, we're seeing a demographic transition, and we're seeing a geopolitical transition. And they're all happening at the same time, <clears throat> which is quite unprecedented. Like in my professional career, this is the first time that such a, such a big change is happening. And it's structural in nature. These four major forces are... <coughs> Uh, self-reinforcing in a way, but potentially also contradicting each other. And uh, there's a couple of implications for that. I think longer term, and that's where the market is struggling to price, uh, to price properly, is uh, we believe that this is pointing to structurally lower GDP growth uh, globally and uh, higher inflation. Uh, and this is a, a, almost like a paradigm shift compared to the last 20, 25 years. So in a way, we are in a regime change. Mm -hmm. which is very difficult for market to price because uh, we normally look at what has happened in the past. So that's uh, exactly where we are right yeah. now. And I guess underpinning everything is the cost of money, right, the cost of credit. And, and again, how much of that is structural given the shifts, the four shifts that you were talking about it? Well, look, uh, if uh, we're right in saying that inflation will be structurally higher, like no, not dramatically higher, but probably averaging the 3%, uh, of course, the floor in interest rates will be significantly higher than the one that we have seen in the previous cycle. So the zero interest rate, probably we're not going to see it for quite some time. So there's a, there's a structural element also in interest rates. And by the way, uh, uh, slightly higher interest rates are not bad necessarily. What has, I think has really hurt uh, um, the economy, the system, is the speed at which rates have risen over the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, not necessarily the absolute level, but the speed has been, uh, has been really significant. Um, Sandra, we also had the governor of Banco de Portugal a short while ago here, and this, this is what he had to say on European growth. Are data dependent, and these uh, mm. data uh, really are good. Uh, they show that inflation globally uh, is falling. The same thing is true for, for the Eurozone. Uh, we got a number for uh, October that is uh, already below 3%. We must be patient, uh, but yes. uh, we have this feeling that we are doing our job. 
I mean, he was talking about anxiety, right, over a soft landing. What, what kind of questions do your, your clients want from you? Is it, does it feel good actually being in charge of an asset manager right now, or is it getting a crowded space? Look, as a, as a business, uh, I think we're also going through significant transition. I mean, it's been a great business to be in over the last 20 years, top-line growth, uh, margin expansion, uh, and driven by structural forces. I mean, the reality is that today, even in Europe, uh, only one-third of households have uh, their assets and savings professionally managed, and this will continue. So I think we continue to be in a, in a growth mode, but the other driver for us has been uh, market performance because our asset base goes up and down with market, and structurally over the last 15 years we've seen assets going down because of market performance. I think the next year will be a bit more challenging because probably we have a view that actually equity, or equity, expected equity return will be subdued somewhat relative to what we have seen in the past. Uh, and that will have an impact on the structure of our industry. And everyone is discussing about uh, you know, uh, pressures on cost, uh, we'll have pressures on the, on the top line as well. So it's a bit of a reversal of, of the previous uh, long cycle that we've seen in asset management. But I think it's crucially important that we reestablish our role from a, also from a policy making perspective. We're a key mechanism in reallocating capital. And I think one of the I think structural debate that we're having with policymaker and regulator is how we can support the, on one side is a big transition that we're, we have just made, made reference to and make sure that we support the reallocation to capital of capital for uh, energy transition for example. So uh, I think we're playing an important role. I think it needs to come with an increased uh, retail participation in capital yeah. markets, uh, which is something that I think we started to see happening, but uh, it's still too low. But it, given where we are now, and I'm not speaking about BNP Paribas management in general, do you think that the flow of capital is going to where it should be, given the, the shift also for the green transition, or is there still a lot of work to be done? Look, it's, it started to go in the, in the direction that policymakers has, uh, has identified. I think if we look at the flows in the sustainable related product, uh, Article 8, 9, I don't want to go too much into the technicalities. Over the last two and a half, three years, we definitely have seen this product uh, attracting more flows than uh, all other products. So uh, this is happening. I think also the deal that we're seeing on sustainability on the private asset side is clearly going in the right direction. Now, having said that, the challenges for supporting the net zero transition is just huge. I mean, it's an additional three and a half trillion dollars per year to support net zero transition. And uh, so it's not enough. I mean, we're just at the beginning. And of course, there's, a, there's an element of expected return. Uh, we have seen a bit of pressures over the last uh, few months of, uh, on performance of products which are a bit more sustainable. Uh, look, this is a cyclical business, so we'll see it more and more going in waves. Uh, but we're just at the beginning, and I think we need to accelerate because the reality is that uh, the pace at which, especially in Europe, we have um, deployed renewable sources is not enough to be consistent with our one and a half uh, degree pathways. So we need to accelerate so now. We were talking a bit about markets, uh, client behavior. We were talking about the, the, you know, the reality of stagflation. And you very clearly and beautifully put the fact that we're going through a massive transition, that there are four parts of the transition and we don't exactly know where we end up. What, what does it mean for asset managers? Well, for our industry, again, we will have to cope with possibly lower growth uh, nope. and probably subdued equity returns, which clearly is, a, is an important determinant of our revenue growth. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, uh, we're definitely going to see a revival of fixed income. I mean, with rates, uh, long rates and short rates, uh, being that eye on both sides of the ocean, I think that creates clearly opportunities. And I think we start to see money flowing into fixed income product uh, from probably September onwards. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the value proposition is reasonably simple. You might lock in for five, ten years, anywhere between four and a half uh, to five percent, which actually is a great stabilizer of your uh, portfolio return. Uh, Sandra, is the 60-40 portfolio dead? I've been asking this for the last, I feel well, like it, definitely it's last been year a was dead. <laughs> De definitely last year was dead. And clearly, I mean, we have done a lot of research like everyone else. It shows that actually the benefit of diversification of bonds was no longer there because bonds moved, uh, they were completely correlated with equities, which is normally uh, doesn't happen. And, w and that's the reason of uh, the diversification of portfolio. Now, uh, probably the way the 60-40 portfolio has been thought through over the last uh, decade is over. But the, the need of having a diversified approach to your investment is key. And I think what has changed compared to last year is that the base rate, the, the base level of yield 
is clearly higher. So your starting point is 4.5%. You have a carry that uh, will be used as a buffer to offsetting of volatility in bond prices. So uh, I think our view at this stage is that bond will definitely provide, again, diversification and, and protection in an environment which is going to be very volatile. I also, I mean, you're the chief executive of a very sizable asset manager. What does, it, what does AI mean Oof. for how you service your client? Is it something that you spend a lot of time on, or do you spend more time really trying to figure out where capital flow goes to in the transition? No, we, we spend time on everything that we think is going to be strategically significant. But I would say that AI, I think, is very early days, uh, not only in our industry, although we start to see some meaningful impact. But uh, I think where we're focusing right now on AI in everything that is uh, has a potential to generate efficiency okay. and automation. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the number of use cases that the team has brought up is just huge, and we need to prioritize, we need to test. And there's another element which is important. Everyone is talking about AI. The reality is that if you don't have your data set in orders, there's not a lot that you can do with AI because it's about accessing data. And there's probably a bit of catch-up that, that needs to be done there. So we're looking at it. We are starting to frame our journey towards uh, using increasingly AI. But at the same time, I mean, uh, what keeps us uh, busy now is trying to understand whether we have the right product offer for a cycle which is going to be very different in a way. Uh, talk to me about, I mean, asset management is a crowded space. How do, how do European asset managers compare with U.S. ones or Asian ones? The brands feel very strong. Do you get that? Kind of, does it translate into revenue? Look, overall, um, I would say the European asset managers are doing, are doing quite well. I think they've benefited from uh, the brand of Usits, which is the vehicle that has, uh, has proven to be a pretty effective vehicle uh, to protect investors and uh, with a very good regulatory framework. Uh, and I think Usits is now being recognized as a, as a brand, uh, not only in Europe, but also outside Europe. Uh, there's a difference, which is a structural difference between U.S. and, uh, and, and Europe uh, from an asset management perspective. The first one is that U.S. asset manager, their home, ba their home market is the largest market in the world and is one single market. For European asset manager, the, even if European Union capital market unit, but doing business in different countries is not exactly the same thing. So the level of economies of scale is completely different. And the second major difference is that U.S. Asset, managers, uh, asset management industry has grown because of a significant tax incentive when it comes to long-term savings, the uh, 401k plan, which I think is still missing in Europe. So structurally, these are, I would say, the two main differences. But the human capital in Europe is now absolutely great, and I think uh, we feel we can absolutely compete uh, with uh, some of the largest players. And uh, we'll see growth.